Welcome to our latest session on Scientists Answer Your Questions, a series of free webinars that are sponsored by the participants in the Vitamin D Action Project at Grassroots Health. I'm Sharon McDonald of Grassroots Health, and today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Ms. Wiki, who will be presenting on vitamin D and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Ms. Wiki is a researcher at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He has published many studies on vitamin D and its role in Alzheimer's disease onset and prevention. So Dr. Mizwicki, it's all yours. We are very eager to hear your presentation today. Well, thank you, Sharon, for the introduction. And um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, start the uh, presentation uh, by kind of giving some background on, on AD and its, uh, and its prevalence in the society today. And, uh, and then, of course, talk about how vitamin D may aid in preventing um, and also uh, treating Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a disease most well characterized by the death or malfunction of neurons in the brain, which can eventually impair an individual's ability to carry out such bodily, basic bodily functions as walking and swallowing, and is ultimately fatal. In fact, it's, six, it's currently the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. And currently, one in eight people age 65 and older have AD, and nearly half of individuals 85 and over have been diagnosed with AD. The MRI images, which are shown here on the left, compare a normal brain to that of an AD brain. Um, and what it shows is that the MRI shows that in AD, the hippocampus, as well as other areas of the brain, uh, undergo atrophy or they, they, the neurons die. Uh, while the brain uh, has been the focal point of AD, uh, the disease has also been associated with changes in the chemistry and functions of blood-borne cells. And these are namely white blood cells, which are depicted in the bottom figure here. And we can actually isolate white blood cells by doing some centrifugation and uh, some hypophycal gradients. And you can see that they're about 1% of the cell content, and they're found in the uh, intermediate uh, band here in the actual tube. Um, this talk will focus on what may cause these changes in AD and how vitamin D3, and namely the vitamin D hormone, 1 alpha 25 dihydroxy vitamin D3, may play a role in controlling the communication between blood-borne cells and neurons and the, also the function of blood-borne cells. So the communication between neurons and the blood is in part facilitated by a subset of white blood cells which are called peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Macrophages, and they're composed of uh, monocytes and lympho lymphocytes. Macrophages in particular are monocytes a critical role in the body uh, that being the removal of cellular debris and disease-causing pathogens from the body in a process termed phagocytosis. So these are basically the body's garbage collectors. Uh, so they cleanse the body of cellular debris and also pathogens. And actually in this image below here that you see, this macrophage is actually about to engulf or phagocytose a foreign particle or pathogen here. So two proteins uh, in neurons have been associated with AD uh, disease pathophysiology, that is the progression of Alzheimer's disease. They are the truncated form of amyloid beta, which is amyloid beta 1 to 42, and also the intracellular protein termed tau. tau. Uh, in AD, the deregulation in the processing of amyloid beta leads to a significant increase in the release of the amyloid beta 142. So the, the actual neurons have uh, a precursor protein on the surface, and when that precursor protein is cleaved and it's incorrectly cleaved, you actually produce the amyloid beta 1, 1 through 42. Um, and the, the actual production of the actual plaques formed by the uh, formation of the increased amount of uh, A beta 1 through 42 are actually uh, shown here by these debris fields in this particular image. So there are two known uh, mutations in genes that are associated with uh, this, this plaque formation. So the presenolin one, 1 and 2 gene, um, if there's a mutation there, you have an it's known to increase the uh, production of A-beta-1 through 42. And also an APOE4 uh, allele being expressed also increases uh, A-beta-1 through 4, 42 deposition. Um, tau is actually an intercellular protein, um, with, and it is known to be hyperphosphorylated in Alzheimer's disease. And the hyperphosphorylation causes neurofibular tangles, 
and this is actually represented in the image by this dark neuronal body versus, you know, versus the control of the healthy cell in this particular image. Um, given time constraints, I will focus only on the effects of A beta 1 through 42 throughout the remainder of the presentation. So the image on the top right of the slide uh, highlights how AD macrophages differ from control macrophages in the reduced ability to phagocytose A beta 1 through 42 in vitro. And this is actually indicated by the green FAM A beta. So here we've, uh, you have a fluorescent form of amyloid beta that the cells are treated with and then they're treated over in an overnight uh, culture, and then we look to see how much green is, is picked up by the actual cells. And you can see that in all six control uh, subjects, the macrophages do a pretty good job of uh, picking up family beta, whereas in all six 80 cases, we have a reduced or even almost absent ability of those macrophages to actually uh, phagocytose the amyloid beta one through family beta. Um, another important finding that was uh, brought out here by Dr. Fiala's laboratory uh, was that when AD macrophages are actually incubated with either a fibular form of A beta 1 through 42 or a soluble form of A beta 1 through 42, these macrophages were incapable or were uh, of, of actually traversing a synthetic blood brain barrier. Um, and so they get kind of stuck on the, on the outside of the actual vessel. Whereas if they're not exposed to A beta, they can freely move into the actual, um, uh, back into the circulatory system. So this result indicates that when peripheral macrophages enter the AD brain to, in effect, cleanse the brain or pick up that amyloid beta plaque, they struggle to get back into the circulatory system. And these, in, these two, in these two ways, Alzheimer's disease macrophages or blood-borne cells are deregulated with respect to control macrophages. Okay, so one of the two, one of the ways in which we evaluate how AD patients and control subjects differ in the response to amyloid beta 1 through 42 is by studying how the gene expression of cytokines and chemokines differ when their PBMCs are challenged with exogenous A beta 1 through 42. Um, cytokines and chemokines are small proteins that send messages between cells and tell them what to do and where to go. They also are key factors that control inflammation in the body. The two figures shown here are what we actually call volcano plots. Um, they depict whether or not the expression of a given gene is upregulated, exploding to the right, or downregulated, exploding to the left, when compared to control. So here we've uh, we've taken the PBMCs um, and we've we've have a we have a set of PBMCs that we don't stimulate, and then we have a set of PBMCs that we stimulate with uh, A beta, and we compare what the we look at and see what the effect of A beta is. And in both cases, uh, we see an increase in the expression of these cytokines and chemokines. However, um, with respect to the actual uh, AD patients in controls, the AD patients have a much broader and much higher expression, much more increased expression of the actual cytokines and chemokines versus the control subjects. And it's also an important, important to note um, that A-beta increased the expression of NF-kappa B, ITG-beta, and also the IL-1 receptor antagonist in the controls, whereas we don't see that in the AD patients. However, um, if you look at the actual baseline comparison of controls in AD patients, AD patients have a significantly higher expression of these three components at baseline, showing you that potentially the A-beta Overprodu oh, the increased amount of A beta in the AD patients has already upregulated these genes, and so when the when we when you add exogenous A beta, um, there is no effect. When we look at the effect of 125 um, on the the effect of A beta here, we see that 125 can temper or reverse many of the effects of A beta on cytokine and chemokine expression in AD PBMCs. Um, as you can see, all the dots predominate lie to the left of the midline, okay? So that's showing that majority of the genes that are on the array that we're using here are actually downregulated by uh, 125 when the cells are also exposed to A beta. Um, uh, because the majority of cytokines and chemokines upregulated by A beta 1 through 42 and down, are downregulated by 125D3 uh, are associated with pro-inflammatory signaling, uh, we can conclude from these results that 125D3 has an anti-inflammatory effect in AD PBMCs that are exposed to A beta 1 through 42. 
Uh, another important dose-dependent effect of 125D3 on 80 blood-borne cells is the stimulation of A beta 1 through 42 phagocytosis by macrophages. So in this experiment, 80 macrophages are cultured on glass slides, treated with the indicated nanomolar concentration of 125D3, 1 nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, and 100 nanomolar here. Um, and then approximately 30 minutes later, 2 micrograms uh, per mil of FAMA beta, fluorescent FAMA beta, uh, which is green, is added. And so after overnight incubation, the macrophages are fixed and stained with phylloidin, which is red, okay? And, and the cell area, then that defines the actual cell area. Uh, they're also stained with DAPI, which is blue, and you can see that defines the actual nucleus of the macrophage. And then we, we look to see the amount, uh, and look at, look at the amount of green that is in each one of the cells, and that's what's plotted here to the left. And as you can see, there's a dose-dependent effect. Um, there's significant effect at one nanomolar, but the, the, in this particular experiment with uh, six different AD patients, uh, we see that the most potent effect is actually with 100 nanomolar, 125. Um, uh, if you recall that I, we showed one of the cytokines that was upregulated by, significantly upregulated by A beta in uh, AD patients with IL-1 beta. So IL-1-beta is one of the cytokines uh, that is, is very pro-inflammatory. Um, and in the figures, uh, and what we're showing here is that when we actually uh, add IL-1-beta by itself, and this should be FAMA-beta, um, we see no effect of IL-1-beta on phagocytosis of FAMA-beta. Uh, when we add 125D, as we showed before, we see a, a potent uh, in increase in the phagocytosis of FAMA-beta. And then when we add IL-1-beta in conjunction with 125, the IL-1-beta, or the inflammatory cytokine, uh, reduces the actual effect of 125 in uh, promoting A-beta phagocytosis by these AD macrophages. Um, another important effect of 125 on AD macrophages is that we, we, sh we show that it blocks the, the apoptosis of uh, FAMA beta, or, or, or sorry, of macrophages exposed to fibular uh, A beta. And also, we've shown the same thing with soluble A beta. And the importance here is that, um, is that when, when you activate caspase 3, um, you actually are activating ap apoptosis. So this is showing that we block that. And the importance here is that if you have a macrophage that is loaded in the brain and trying to get back into the circulatory system and undergoes apoptosis, Essentially, it's going to deposit that payload of amyloid beta in a new spot within the brain and then thereby uh, potentially spreading the disease. It can also die on its way into, back into the circulatory system and therefore coat the actual blood vessels of the central nervous system with amyloid beta and harden the actual vessel, which can cause problems in and of itself. Okay. We also know uh, that uh, both the, re the known receptors for 125D, both the intracellular known receptors for 125, the nuclear vitamin D receptor, as well as the protein disulfide isomerase 3, um, are required for 125 to promote this phagocytic, uh, phagocytosis of FAMA beta uh, in 80 macrophages. We know this by using an analog that blocks uh, the function of the nuclear vitamin D receptor as well as an antibody that, uh, that blocks the function of the PDIA3 receptor. And we also uh, have used blocking agents to show that 125D3 at least requires G-protein coupled signaling, uh, lipid signaling, which is uh, denoted by here by PI3 kinase, um, also uh, MAP kinase signaling, which is denoted by MEK12 here, uh, PKA, protein kinase A, as well as calcium. So all these factors, um, are, are, are intracellular signaling factors that 125 uh, uses or in part regulates in order to promote phagocytosis of FAMA beta. So to conclude, what I'd like to do is leave you with a, a basic model of what we believe to be an important role of 125D3 in supporting the function of the innate immune system, which are the macrophages in this case, and in doing so aid in preventing AD pathophysiology. So first, let's review what we believe to be occurring in healthy subject brain when A beta 1 through 42 is produced by neurons. So amyloid beta can be produced and deposited in the brain in response to events such as head trauma or ischemia. So here the amyloid beta is deposited. That 
deposition is near the neuron causes the neuron to send out a chemical signal. These are the chemokines. And those chemokines recruit the macrophage from the periphery to uh, bind to the uh, A beta plaque, phagocytose the plaque, and then that can then, re that, then that, macro that loaded macrophage then returns to the circulatory system and is processed, um, uh, you know, it's, it's transported away from the brain and eventually uh, to the liver for processing. So in AD, what we what we see is we what we've showed is that we have disruption in uh, family beta phagocytosis, and we also have disruption um, in the ability of the of the peripheral macro, macrophage to re-enter uh, the circulatory system. So here, the family beta, uh, or the, the sorry, the, the fibrillary beta deposit uh, causes the chemokine signal, recruits the macrophage, the macrophage binds to the uh, the fibular A beta, the A beta deposit. Um, it, the binding may or may not result in the actual phagocytosis. So here it's just sitting up on the surface. Um, it, some, some, some of the actual plaque may be ingested by the macrophages. And then these, of course, macrophages can, can move either to the actual uh, blood brain barrier, uh, which is the, the actual endothelial vessel there as well as maybe uh, also some may actually re-enter the circulatory system. But the difference between a control macrophage and AD macrophages is that these AD macrophages undergo apoptosis. And when, when they do undergo apoptosis, they can deposit the, the uh, A-beta in a new place within the brain and or again in the actual, in the actual vessel. And the, the, the ones that do make it back into the circulatory system are still also subject to apoptosis, which can leave uh, amyloid, amyloid beta in the circulatory system, which can then aggravate another macrophage, and this whole cycle just continues, essentially. And as AD progresses, what we believe is that more and more of the deposition in the, in the brain, as well as in the actual vessel, um, increases because we, we continue to reduce the amount that actually gets back into the circulatory system. Um, we believe the, the model is consistent with the results that we presented today and also with the fact that in recent clinical trial using the antibody to A-beta, um, an increase in what is termed A-beta cerebral angi amyloid angiopathy or an increase in amyloid deposits in the walls of the blood vessels of the central nervous system was actually observed. observed. Um, our data, as well as the work of other laboratories, suggests that 125D3 plays a role in preventing and or slowing the progression of AD by regulating the function and survival of innate immune cells, i.e., the macrophages in this particular case, and also by functioning as a neuroprotective hormone. And this has been work that's been done by other laboratories. So 125D3 functions in both the blood and the brain to promote optimal brain health. That's the major take-home message, I think, that's important. And that all said, it is true that additional studies must be carried out to further test our model and at the same time address potential abnormalities in the endogenous production of 125D3 by AD macrophages. So AD macrophage, or macrophages in general are known to be able to convert 25D3 to 125D3. And it, to my knowledge, no studies have been done uh, that indicate that this may be, be disrupted uh, in the AD macrophages. And then also, we also need to look at how vitamin D sat status may be associated with AD onset and or AD progression, and also how it may influence, uh, you know, the model that we're presenting today. And so with that, I'd like to thank Grassroots and everybody in the audience uh, for their time. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Miswicki. That is very interesting and exciting research. Before um, before we get to our questions today, I'm going to go over one slide um, very quickly. And so one of the most frequent questions we get is, uh, no matter who is speaking, is how much do I take? And so um, we actually did a study of over 3,000 people, and uh, we created a simple sh chart showing their responsiveness based on where they started. You can take a look at where the arrow points, and if you start at 20 nanograms per milliliter, and you want to get to 50, and you weigh about 150 pounds, it's going to take you upwards of about 4,000 international units per day to get there on average. It might take more or it might take less. There's considerable variability, and our recommendation is always that you test. So with that, Dr. Mizwicki, 
um, we will get to our questions. So the first one is, at what level of vitamin D do the neuroprotective benefits kick in? Is there a minimum level that you would suggest? Okay. Um, well, to answer that question, I don't think the, the research has been definitive uh, here with a, an exact value. Um, I can tell you that we, uh, we do counsel our patients to try, first of all, to see where they're at in terms of their vitamin D level. That's something that we do as well. Um, and uh, we, we, tell, we try to get them to a level of about 60 nanograms per mil. That's what our goal is, uh, to get their serum levels set. Great, great. And question two is, what is the effective plasma level of D required for prevention? At what age should this be started? Okay, again, uh, I don't think there's a definitive level that's been defined as being uh, where you want to be at. I can tell you that uh, there are studies that, um, well, at least one in elderly women that show uh, low daily intake uh, increases AD versus uh, other forms of dementia. And there was another uh, recent study carried out by uh, French researchers um, that basically went through recent published work uh, looking at the number of, uh, and in do so in looking at a number of observational studies, uh, and they concluded that AD uh, uh, cases had uh, uh, reduced serum 25D levels uh, when compared to matched controls, but again, uh, the actual level that is quote-unquote uh, neuroprotective um, in terms of quote-unquote preventing AD uh, those studies still need to be carried out um, in a large uh, placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial. Great. Thank you. Um, and question three is, is there a dose effect with vitamin D serum level or vitamin D supplementation? And is the severity of dementia um, and the severity of dementia symptoms? Yeah. I think uh, the... The one study that I'm aware of uh, showed that in the elderly women that were taking, I think, uh, 2,000, around 2,000 IUs uh, per day, um, they had a higher uh, AD incidence still than those that were taking upwards of 3,500. Um, but again, uh, these things uh, need to be uh, addressed with a large placebo-controlled uh, randomized clinical trial. Great. Okay, next section. All right, number four, we're on vitamin D and Alzheimer's disease. What does research show about any relationship between vitamin D and Alzheimer's? That's a very broad question, but is there anything you want to address with that question? Um, yeah, the, uh, so with vitamin D, uh, with serum levels, um, you know, there's not much there's not much out there. But with respect to 125D, there's a lot of different things um, um, that would that show uh, efficacy, efficacy of, of, of quote unquote vitamin D uh, in in Alzheimer's. Um, there's there's a uh, there's been studies that have been shown that uh, when you have uh, a mixed neuronal uh, glial cell cultures, uh, with glial cells are actually resident macrophages in the in the brain. Um, and so when you look at those, they showed uh, 125D altered the expressions of genes that potent potentially limit the uh, progression of AD. Um, there's also evidence that uh, actually serum vitamin D protein uh, binds uh, amyloid beta. The potential there could be that it reduces uh, uh, amyloid plaque, however, uh, plaque formation. However, there also is the, the, uh, the issue that if you have too high uh, DBP, or if you have really high DBP, you might be reducing the amount of free 25-hydroxy-D that's available to macrophages to um, make 125-D3 uh, D um, uh, themselves. Um, and then there's also been uh, a VDR uh, tau bf holotype that has been uh, shown, recently shown, just recently shown, to be significantly increased in AD patient groups. So there is a um, uh, a holotype of BDR that uh, that may be uh, associated with uh, with AD incidence. Great, thank you. Next question is number five, and that is what form of vitamin D was used in the Alzheimer's studies? So, for, so most of the work done with in vitro, um, if, if not all of the work done in vitro, uh, was done with 125 dihydroxy vitamin D three. 
Um, and to my knowledge, the, the work that has been done uh, in terms of vitamin D and its association with dementia, it's vitamin D3 is the, is the form that's been used. Great. And the next one is, how well are the mechanisms for this link known? Um, the, those mechanisms are, are currently still under investigation. Um, they're, they're really not well known. Um, so we still need to define, uh, define these things. Um, one of the issues is that there's a significant amount of heterogeneity uh, in the patient population um, with respect to AD and how they respond to different small molecules. And so, uh, you know, that's something that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, there, there is evidence that uh, that 125D3 uh, blocks uh, the production of TNF-alpha, which is a very, in, in PBMCs, especially T cells, which is uh, uh, important, um, of course, in, in uh, controlling inflammation. Um, and one of the things that I might, uh, in, the, in the talk, is that one of the kind of take-home messages uh, is that what, what, we've, what we've been able to show is that if you have uh, severe inflammation, um, that that is one of the major factors that disrupts, you know, phagocytosis. And so controlling inflammation is an important factor in allowing for macrophages to function perhaps correctly. Um, and I also know that uh, there's a recent uh, uh, work that was published, which is an imaging uh, study uh, that showed uh, decreased 25D3 serum levels uh, actually um, uh, showed increased dysfunction in the frontal subcortal uh, uh, neuronal circuits, and so there is there is some evidence that uh, that low D3 um, at least uh, can lead to um, uh, issues with uh, neuronal homeostasis. Great, thank you. Number seven is is vitamin D more effective in prevention? or can it slow the progression as well? Also, can vitamin D reduce or reverse Alzheimer's once it has started, if I already have symptoms? Right. Um, I think the answer is probably going to be that we don't know the definitive answer yet, but I think it's, it's probably more effective in prevention uh, than, uh, than in terms of reversing the actual, the actual disease. Um, and I can tell you that uh, that we do have some evidence that it may slow the progression, but um, the caveat there is that, uh, you know, our patients are not only taking vitamin D3, but they're also taking DHA. So here, you know, it's a combination of the two um, that seems to be maybe, uh, at least preliminary data suggests that it's slowing their progression based off, you know, their MMSC scores, which is a, a way to look at uh, cognitive decline in these patients. Um, it, that seems to be plateauing. Great. And number eight is what improvements or lack of progression have there been associated with vitamin D3 intake? Um, and that, that might be similar to the ones before, but if there's anything new. It is, but in, in vitro, of course, what, um, what, what we show is that, uh, that 125 you know, may help in terms of uh, reducing the lack of progression by correcting uh, deregulated macrophage function. Um, how it is associated with vitamin D3 intake, that's a complex story because, uh, you know, vitamin D is, you know, we have to produce 25 D3 and then not only that, there, there could be, um, you know, a, a, a compromised ability of, of these macrophages to produce 125 D3 locally. So there's a lot of there's a lot of, that's, a, that's a complicated question to, to actually address and, and, and the research is really just beginning to start in, in, terms, of, in terms to address those questions. Great. And, and uh, Dr. Mizwicki, can I have you define um, in vitro for us? Uh, in vitro just means that, the, that we, take, uh, we take cells from the actual patient, so we have primary cells, and we test them in culture. So it's not in the actual organism, it's actually in a, in a petri dish or, like I said before, in a glass slide. But there, it's, it's cells in culture. Great. And question nine is, is the D3 efficacy on, a, on Alzheimer's disease based on raised AMP levels? That, that, that's, a, 
that I don't I don't know of a study that's actually shown uh, that directly, but I can tell you that uh, indirectly, uh, or, or we we have some causative evidence that that may be one of the components that's important. And the, I say this because AMP is the actual precursor to what we call cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP is a, a key component in activating that protein kinase A, which was one of the one of the kinases that. Uh, we showed, uh, you know, it's important for 125D3 to promote phagocytosis of, of, of amyloid beta. Um, it also uh, is PKA, that, that kinase is also important in, um, in activating a, a chloride channel that we've investigated that is, that is critical to uh, phagocytosis and the processing of the actual, uh, the actual, uh, what they call the phagosome. So when, when the, when the, when the macrophage um, brings in the amyloid beta, that, that, vessel, that vessel has to be processed. And if that vessel is not processed correctly, it can actually be the, the main trigger for the apoptosis. And so, uh, so it may be important in that, in that respect. Thank you. And we are at our 10.30 mark. We still have a couple of questions left, but for those of you who are ready to close out, I would like to quickly tell you about next week's webinar. Let's get back to that slide. So um, next week we'll be sharing a 30-minute lecture about the interactions between vitamin D and calcium. Here's the slide for you uh, by Dr. Haney. And he will be online to answer your latest questions. And so thank you all for joining. And for those of you who are able to stay, we will continue with our questions for Dr. Mizwicki. And so we are on question 10. Is there a genetic link? My mother and maternal grandmother both have Alzheimer's for the last, at least 10 years, but live to 94 and 100 years old. Okay, so there's, there's, there's no one, uh, you know, uh, genetic mutation that quote-unquote causes AD. There are those, those two that I mentioned, uh, the presenolin uh, mutation that uh, increases risk and actually, um, you know, it's, uh, it's it's, it's, it's problematic and increases the, the risk of AD. Um, there's that APOE4, uh, you know, allele that, um, that can, again, increase your risk. And then the recent study that was uh, uh, done by uh, the group in Turkey with respect to VDR showed that that tau BF uh, halotype may significantly increase AD uh, patient, or may increase uh, uh, AD incidence. Um, but there's no, there's no, uh, what I want to say, there's no one mutation that, um, that automatically uh, designates that you'll get AD. Thank you. All right. And we will go to our uh, next slide. So question 11, are there any other nutrients that need to be present in order to enable vitamin D to protect us from Alzheimer's? Such as DHA, EPA from fish oil, or any other cofactors. Well, I would. I would what we sh what we what we've shown uh, just recently is that uh, vitamin D and DHA are 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D3, as well as a uh, downstream metabolite of DHA called resolvin D1. Um, that the combination of these two actually seem to be synergistic in terms of uh, enhancing uh, macrophage function. So in that respect, um, you know, we believe DHA is important. And like I said before, our patients are, are uh, taking a, um, a drink called Smartfish, from, which is made by a company in Norway um, that contains both DHA and vitamin D. Um, and those patients seem to, at least from the, from the, uh, from the aspect of inflammation, uh, they, their inflammation seems to have been normalized uh, by by taking the supplement DHA vitamin D um, in that in that regard. Uh, other cofactors, um, you know, I don't know of uh, of any particular ones, but of course, magnesium is an important thing to take with vitamin D because it helps with the the processing of uh, of vitamin D. So perhaps that one, but um, no other ones that I can think of right off the top of my head. Great, thank you. And number 12, are there generally more cases of Alzheimer's north of latitude 42, 
where folks have less opportunity to make their own vitamin D? Uh, that question, I don't, I don't know of a study that has definitively showed that. Um, so I still think the, that type of epidemiological uh, data still needs to be, uh, or that study needs to be done. All right, number 13. What can you say about vitamin D3 and Parkinson's? Uh, well, we don't study Parkinson's, uh, you know, in our laboratory, but I do know of a report that showed that just recently that was published uh, this past year uh, that showed um, serum concentrations of 25D3 were correlated inversely with uh, Parkinson's severity. Um, so uh, it that particular study indicates that uh, vitamin D3 may uh, at least with individuals that already have Parkinson's may uh, slow the progression of the actual uh, disease. Um, and there are other studies that show uh, PD uh, increases the prevalence, uh, or the vitamin D e in insufficiency actually increases the prevalence of PD as well. Uh, but again, we don't do that work here at the UCLA. And number 14, how does depression link to low vitamin D and loss of brain function? Uh, again, uh, th these type, th this would be causative uh, links. We do know that depression does alter brain function. In fact, there was a UCLA researcher that just recently published uh, how, how depression affects brain function versus uh, uh, individuals that were not depressed. However, the link to low D um, and, the, and the brain function, I still think needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed. Great. And next one, can vitamin D improve memory in healthy individuals? And also, does vitamin D play a role in cognitive health for younger people? Um, I don't know if, this, again, I don't know if studies have been uh, carried out to definitively show this, but uh, certainly both vitamin D3 and DHA um, are linked, you know, to enhanced memory um, as well as uh, good cognitive health. Um, and in younger people, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's speculative, but I, I would think that it, it would probably be beneficial for cognitive health in, in younger people only because, uh, you know, of the association of uh, vitamin D deficiency and things such as autism and so, so on and so forth. Thank you. And the last question for today's webinar is what can we learn from these results in relation to the pressing issue regarding head trauma in the NFL? Well, you know, if, our, if that model that I showed on the last slide is, is, is you know, is, um, is quote unquote correct, we still have to, of course, do more uh, testing uh, to, uh, and other people as well and repeat the work. But if we are correct there, then, um, then it could have an extremely big in impact on the, on you know these these, these head traumas and whatnot because um, you know if the the head trauma itself produces the the amyloid beta one through forty two and that's actually um, a protective mechanism you know that the brain has but if you if those, if that amyloid beta is not cleansed you know from the brain then it could perhaps lead to uh, you know deposits um, and perhaps dementia that are AD or other types of dementia. So, um, so ha having vitamin D, uh, so having vitamin D insufficiency could actually be an impactful in that respect. But again, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure those, those studies are, are, are being uh, carried out uh, right now. And I do know that it, with respect to, uh, with respect to the fish oil, with respect to DHA, that, um, uh, that, there have been studies that have shown that if you have red blood cell lipid content of 8% of, you know, uh, DHA, that it actually protects against, uh, uh, you know, the, the side of, or the, uh, the downstream effects of head trauma and whatnot. The effect of vitamin D, serum vitamin D levels, I think it still, again, uh, needs to be addressed. Great. Well, that's it for this week's questions. Thank you, Dr. Mizwicki, for your great presentation and um, the question and answer time. And again, uh, next week we'll be talking about vitamin D and calcium with Dr. Haney. So thank you all for attending today, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.